Hello, I'm the Grub Street Lodger, and a while ago, or probably a few years ago actually, I made a sort of fake book haul video, sort of a parody, and I said about my Christopher Smart collection, and I was going to show it off one day. And actually, I am going to show it off today. I'm going to um, go through some of the books, and I'm going to talk about Christopher Smart and why he means a lot to me, and why I'm so interested in him. Um, I'm quite proud of my Christopher Smart library, genuinely. I think it's one of the uh, fullest uh, libraries of Christopher Smart you could probably get domestically. Anyway, so I've got these, which are works by Christopher Smart. Um, they include various different versions of his poems because uh, new ways of thinking created new ways of formatting some of them. Uh, and, and some of his uh, translation work and his magazine work. So that's my by Christopher Smart collection. Then there's biographies of him. Oh no, actually before then, his letters, of which um, he wrote even fewer letters than Goldsmith, it seems. Most of them begging for money. Uh, and then biographies of him, of which I think this is all you can get. I think that's all the purpose biographies of him. This is the earliest. Shows you how much was known. And then these two are the later ones, as more scholarship on him has happened. And then I've got some purposeful ones about his poetry, um, and about poetics and things, his relationship to satire. Uh, these are collections of general essays about him. There's a couple more of these sorts of ones I haven't got, largely because of price and availability. I think this cost me like £50. Yeah. They're meant for universities to buy. I don't think individual people really are intended to have them. And then, uh, sorry, I looked at earlier, um, a biography of Christopher Smart's cat, interestingly. And so my plan is to tell his story, uh, read uh, some excerpts of his stuff, and just give you a flavour of him. So, Christopher Smart was the son of a, um, a state manager. And when his dad died... He and his family moved up north. So they used to live in this place called, um, it's not called Pleasantville. It's got a really lovely name, but they moved up north to a place called Stainedrop Moor. And to me, that sums up northern place names. It always sound miserable. Though he loved Stainedrop Moor and he had a good time. And he uh, was obviously very bright from the beginning. He showed uh, particularly an aptitude for poetry and for uses of language. And so the the woman who was owned the estate thought that she'd give her own money to send him to university, and he went there and he did okay. And they um, he he graduated, and then he became what's called the scholar of the university. He won a prize, and that meant he could stay on and and become sort of a sort of an early not not full professor, but on the way, and. They instituted a thing called the Seton Prize, which was poems about God. In fact, it was it didn't say about God. It said poems on the qualities of the supreme being. And he entered it four times uh, over the course of five years. One year he didn't enter it because he was sick. But he entered it four times, and he won every time he, he did it. And in fact, those poems I find kind of dull. <laughs> They're, they've got... These very grand titles, just going to get to, I can't remember which volume. The, on the omniscience of the supreme, be, supreme being, on the eternity on the, of the supreme being. And he kept winning them. And it gave Pembroke College, his college, certain kudos and a lamb because he kept winning them. And this kudos kind of helped him cause trouble. Well, he did... He was, he was very lively and very excitable. Um, some people now think he might have been manic depressive because he has these bursts of extreme excitement and then complete fallow. So he put on a play with the students he wrote himself and the other writers, the other writers, the other sort of professors and, and academics around sort of laughing at him for getting involved in this stupid comedy and everyone laughing together and having a lovely time. Like, that's kind of silly. That's not proper scholarship. Um, he and Gray didn't get on very well. He describes Gray as uh, walking like he shit himself and looking like he smelt it. So yeah, they didn't get on very well. Also, 
he wasn't really cut out for university life because at the time to be at the university, you had to uh, take religious orders. You couldn't marry. You had to be kind of upright and, and chaste and not go to the pub, get absolutely drunk and write love poetry to the barmaids, which is what Christopher Smart did. And Christopher Smart then started going down to London and making sort of contacts there. Um, and it's clear that his interest was far more in, in being a gadabout, really, writing for magazines, writing silly poems and having fun rather than being a scholar at the university. But they, they kept him on the books for a long time because he kept winning these Seatonian prizes. But in the end, he married, and by then, they just couldn't uh, write. And ties were cut, and so now he lived in London, and he had to make all of his living off of his writing, not just a, you know, a stipend from the university. And the person he married was called Anna Maria Carnan, who was the stepdaughter of Newbury, and Newbury was a publisher. You might have heard of him because of the Newbury Children's Awards, um, he did do a lot of children's books. He worked with a number of people. One of the first sort of intentional children's books is the Little Pretty Little Pretty Pocket Book. This is there by John Newbury. It may have been that Smart wrote this or some of this. Um, it may have also have been that Oliver Goldsmith wrote that because Oliver Goldsmith also wrote for Newbury and wrote things like Goody Two Shoes and may have written Hickory Dickory Dock. And so he started working for Newbury. Uh, in his children's books, but also in various magazines, one called The Student, which is all sort of student comedy and larkiness, um, and one called The Midwife. And I've got copies of The Midwife. And it's, it's sort of slapstick, a lot of it. He pretends to be an old lady, a midwife, called Maria Midnight. And each part has a section of news from other countries where he takes the mick out of the news coverage of other magazines and then they have like silly things like a machine that can grind old people young and various other things comic letters um pretend adverts for silly items and products and it's all just sort of silly really that's the whole point of it and in this time he's writing poems like uh, the big nose fair which is a poem in which uh, the author fancies a girl with a very big nose and it says you know my heart says yes uh, but my face says no because your nose is so big we can't actually get together to kiss and so he kisses the unguarded cheeks uh, around the other way and so yeah silly very silly uh, there's what he was a very short man and there's one where he writes a poem about being a short man and it's a kind of uh, jocks and geeks kind of thing the idea is that you know these big strong men might not be big in the mind and there's all this stuff about, you know, I'm very, I've got a greater soul than them, even if they've got a greater body. But then <laughs> he simply says on physicalness, you know, those breasts of yours, they were made to be delicately pressed, not crushed by these big meaty hands. And so, yeah, he's, he's writing lots of sort of daft, just ephemeral stuff. And he's still writing the odd religious poem as well. So he's got that going on, sort of his serious side. And at this point, this is when Christopher Smart, um, Samuel Johnson has asked to give his opinion about who's the better poet, Christopher Smart or Samuel Derrick. And he says, well, it's, it's the difference between a louse and a flea. There's not much to it. Um, so this is what's going on. And Smart thinks of a way to get some more money. He has a friend called Samuel Foote, who um, was kind of an impressionist. And because there are only two official theatres, Samuel Foote used to put on tea parties. And the tea party may include theatrical entertainment. So you buy your ticket, and really you're going to see a show or a review usually. Um, but the whole wording of it is you're going to see a tea party. And he started putting on his own reviews under the Merry Midnight name. And so he'd dress in drag as an old lady and put on this uh, riotous review. And Samuel Foote would sometimes be there as his niece, and so would various other people. And this started rumours about maybe he was gay or, or some sort of living some sort of trans life. There's stories of him going to Molly houses, perhaps. Uh, he started getting the name Kitty rather than because uh, he was called Christopher Kit Smart. He was known um, Kitty Smart, and that maybe he took on this female persona a bit too much. But they were good successes. Sometimes things went a bit wrong. 
my absolute favourite thing that happened at a Mary uh, Mother Midnight review was there was a French clog dancer with two wooden legs called Monsieur Timberto, and there was a lot of anti-French feeling at the time, and people started sort of picketing and, and, and trying to cancel him because we don't want French dancers at the moment. We're at war with the French. Yeah, it's a Seven Years' War. We're at war with them. And he had to explain, no, 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 no. It's not a French clog dancer with no feet called Mr. Monsieur Tippy Toes. Timber Toes, not Tippy Toes, Timber Toes. It's a French clog dancer. He dances the French clog. He's English. The reason he has no legs is he lost them in a battle with the French at sea. And and he's called Monsieur Timber Toe because I thought that was funnier than Mr. Timber Toe. And so, yeah, there were these sort of flash in the pan outrages. Uh, and at the same time, his magazine's getting uh, a little bit riskier. And this is when he gets sick. Now, he was often sick. He, uh, the, some of the early biographies say he was a drug addict and he was addicted to Hartshorn. But the later biographies point out that Hartshorn was the common uh, remedy for asthma and for asthma attacks. And so he was, uh, he, they already knew he was asthmatic, so he wasn't addicted to Hartshorn. He was taking his medicine for his asthma. At the same time, he would pray. And there's a, a theory, a thought, that some of the times this praying was he'd feel an asthma attack coming on and he'd, he'd calm himself with prayer. And so he'd get rid of the asthma attack. But he got a serious sickness and he wrote what I think is a lovely poem. It's the best poem with the To the Supreme Being, but it wasn't um, written for the for the Seaton Prize. I'm just going to get a bit. Like a lot of his sort of serious poems, they're very long. And in this poem, the hymn to the supreme being, he's talking about how he was ill, and he says, like Noah, he sent out birds, um, you know, sort of internal messages in his soul to send back reports, and the reports he got back were that he was living a bad life, and he was not being a good person, and he was not supporting his family properly, and and everything was awful, and he felt terrible, and that he couldn't be loved by God or by anyone, and that he cried out to God and that he asked for forgiveness and that he promised to live for God ever since and then he got better and so this poem came out and I think the people around him thought it was just a poem indeed his his father-in-law uh, Newbury published it published it with another letter about how good some anti-fever powders St James's powders were because Newbury sold them because a lot of booksellers also sold medicine in fact, these were the same powders that Goldsmith would then dose himself on and die. But so, you know, Newbury's using it as a as an advert, but I'm thinking that Smart's serious about this, because from then on, you get these stories about him stopping people in the street and getting on their knees and getting them to pray and blocking traffic places to pray. And um people started saying, he he's gone mad. You know, he's he's not himself, and he, he's he's a danger to himself with all this, this praying. And Samuel Johnson says, well, surely it's mad and not to pray. And I'd be as happy praying with Christopher Smart as with anyone else. You know, he didn't have personal, he quite liked Christopher Smart, he just didn't rate him very highly as a poet, largely because his poetry was just ephemeral fluff that he put out in all these magazines. Uh, and so... Christopher Smart got taken to St. Luke's Mental Hospital, which was opposite Bedlam, but was more progressive. Uh, not hugely progressive, but they didn't do things like tie you to a chair and spin it round and round and round, which they did do in Bedlam. Essentially, they'd leave you alone. It was um, The idea was that, that you, if you didn't have all the stimulation, that you could detox, essentially. So they, they, they locked him up alone for a year, which for a gregarious man was not, ideal but he was also a gregarious alcoholic uh, Christopher Smart was a noted alcoholic in an age of alcoholics um, again another quote by Samuel Johnson uh, he said that um, you know, Christopher Smart might get his exercise walking to the pub but he was always carried home and so he was actually committed to this madhouse for alcoholism though there was all these other stories about him praying and stopping people to pray and things like this so 
And when he came out after that year, they declared that he was incurable. And so they locked him up in another private Mr. Potter's mental hospital. So this was a private institution run to keep people who they thought were mad off the streets. And again, we're not talking, you know, lock him in a dungeon type stuff here. We're talking a tidy, quiet room, a uh, very stilted regimen, occasional guests, you know, Christopher Smart was visited by Oliver Goldsmith, by Samuel Johnson, by various other people. And then he had a patch in the garden. He he always liked gardening and now he was working on his, his garden and on his flowers. And he had a cat called Jeffrey. And he was there for seven years in this kind of very quiet, um, lonely place. And he worked on a number of things. The most uh, well, most important, but what, one of the most was Jubilate Agno, which I adore. And this is my, I, I had to get the proper copy of Jubilate Agno because I wanted all the notes. Because Jubilate Agno is a really, really dense text. Um, when it was discovered, there was all, uh, in 1939 it was discovered, there was all these stories about him scratching it into the skirting boards of Bedlam. Well, he was never in Bedlam, and he never scratched it on the skirting boards. Uh, and there's probably bits missing. So in the earlier reprints of this poem, um, oh, I'd better explain a little bit. Each sentence begins with the word let or for. Okay, So let bold house of bold rejoice with the hop horn beam. God send me a neighbour this September. So it would be let someone... Um, Rejoice with some animal, and then uh, yeah. Um, and the, the early ones are people from the Bible, and then the later ones become just other people. So early versions of this have all the fours together. So four characters, the votes of the worldlings, but the seal of Almighty God alone. For there is no music in flats and sharps which are not in God's natural key. And then he had other bits that all let, and they were originally printed in chunks. What was discovered was that it was much more likely that the two sheets were supposed to be read concurrently. I said to you, there were lots of sheets, but the lets and the fours. So it was supposed to be, um, I'll pick this at random, let Artemis rejoice with Pastinaca, who is a fish with a sting, for the Lord reviled not all in hardship and temptation unutterable. And so it's based on Jewish sort of chanting, so um, I don't know much about ancient Jewish <laughs> liturgical work, but he read a book in the Madhouse, they had a copy of this book about um, older forms of worship, and it seems at the beginning he's trying to recreate this, so he's got two voices, one says let and one says for, and they're related, and the sort of overall intention is almost like an animal arc. You're getting all the animals and all the people, first from the Bible and then from his life and from history, and you're putting all the animals and people together to praise God. And that's that's the idea. And then it sp spirals out of control. It, it doesn't exactly get away from him, but he starts to realise that this is not a commercial form of poetry. Uh, that he's writing this thing, and that this thing's never going to be published, because it sounds quite mad anyway. And so he starts using it to analyse himself and to think about his life and to remember those he loves and to think about science and his opinions on music. Um, and then towards the end, it's it's almost mechanical. He's just getting things out of dictionaries and, and encyclopedia. He had quite a good library at this, this, this madhouse um, and newspapers. Uh, and it's almost a mechanical act that he writes three of these a day um, just as a way of structuring his day. And so, it's. I love it because it is unreadable. I mean, it, it's not unreadable. I've read it four or five times, but yeah, you know, it's long. A lot of it doesn't make much sense. Um, and when it does make sense, it's pretty, um, pretty peculiar because he's he's revealing his inner self and he's asking himself questions and he's thinking about his opinions on all sorts of various things. And also we don't have all of it. Some of the lets don't have fours, some of the fours don't have lets. So it's a very strange poem. There's all these wonderful little bits like the uh, flapper dapper clapping fish I love. Or let us rejoice like a worm in the rain, which I adore. Or 
Um, there's a picture up there. It's a bit too high. It says, for the circle may be squared by rising and swelling. Uh, I've sort of taken that as a personal um, motto of mine. The circle may be squared by rising and swelling. Because the mathematical problem of squaring the circle is impossible. But if you use your imagination, well, you think, well, you know, it's a circle and you just need to rise it and swell it and rise it and swell it and it becomes a square. There you go. If it's got elastic edges, you just need to pull the edges to make it a square. And it's, it's almost a way of saying, okay, don't always look at the problem as you're given it. Work with the problem, play with the problem, use imagination and playfulness. And it, there's also a slight admittance that it's impossible in that in that he can't do it following the proper rules of how to square a circle, that no one can because it's impossible. As indeed, the person who finally proved that was uh, Lewis Carroll. Um, but in the imagination, it kind of works. I can see it. I can see the circle becoming a square. So it's, it's, it's almost like um, cutting the Gordian knot. And then with the swelling, there is a slight sexual overtone to that as well. The rising and the swelling, especially with some of the things around it. So yeah, there's all sorts of wonderful things in this. But as he was writing this, he was also writing uh, a version of all the Psalms. He was obsessed with King David by this point. Uh, King David is a poet, essentially. And he wrote a poem to King David. And when he was released from the mad madhouse, and this wasn't an official process, someone just came in and took him out. Went, right, you're not in there anymore. And he was like, oh, that's good. Um, he released this. It's called The Song to David. And it's a very, very long poem um, and it ends with this wonderful bit where the word glorious is just repeated and repeated and repeated it's it's about um, Jesus has come and finished the work of God so glorious the sun in mid-career glorious the assembled fires appear glorious the comets train glorious the trumpet and alarm glorious the mighty outstretched arm glorious the enraptured mane glorious the northern lights are stream glorious the song when God's the theme glorious the thunders roar glorious Hosanna from the den glorious the Catholic Amen glorious the martyrs gore glorious more glorious is the crown of him that brought salvation down by meekness called thy son thou art stupendous truth believed and now the matchless deeds achieved determined dared and done it's just such a, um, also when the whole poem's building, it's such a good ending. And uh, when I finish a, a draft, I'm like, yeah, determined, dead and done. I've done it. Um, and it came out to complete, the the, the long, longest review just said, well, bless you, Christopher Smart, but you're still obviously quite mad. Um, yeah. In the 19th century, this that poem became... Um, very popular and very uh, respected and the story of Christopher Smart was then the man who wrote Fluff went mad and his madness created one beautiful work of poetry. Now I, I think and there's a lot of those uh, essay books that sort of have this idea that there's a lot in this later stuff that is in the earlier stuff. I like the earlier stuff. The earlier stuff is good fun and the whole sort of drag review and I love all that. Um, but now we're in the after part, and the after part's kind of sad, and he has to write and write and write, because his his um, reputation for having been in a madhouse means that he can't claim as much money anymore, and he he writes much, and he's so very positive. This is where a lot of the letters come from, because he's asking for money. It's such a very positive thing, and I need to stop now. <laughs> That was my phone. <laughs> well, it wasn't. It was this computer. It was my parents. Um, so I was talking about the positivity. And he he wasn't ever very good with money for a start. And when he started getting less money, he, he couldn't cope with it. And he kept giving it away as well. It has to be said. He was sent a whole bunch of money by um, uh, Fanny Burney's dad, Charles. Who, who they were quite good friends and gave him loads of money, or well, not loads, but you know, a significant amount, and he gave it away. Um, and so he got arrested for debt and he was released, and then he was because his friends paid up, and then he was arrested for debt and he was released because his friends paid up, and then he was arrested for debt, and his friends basically went, Look, 
we're not going to be able to stop this guy from from eating up all his money. One, because he keeps giving it away. Two, because he's not very good with money. And three, because he's not getting much in. So what we'll do is we'll arrange it so that he can live in the liberty of um, the debtor's prison, which means he doesn't have to live in the prison. He has to live in the rough area. And essentially, he has a curfew. And so he did that. And that's how he lived out the rest of his days. And that's where he died. Possibly of... Um, not exactly starvation, but his asthma got worse. He was living in these damp rooms and not eating enough. So that combination probably killed him. His last work was Hymns for the Amusement of Children. And there's just a little poem here called uh, Against Despair. A raven once an acorn took from Bashan's tallest, stoutest tree. He hid it by a limpid brook and lived another oak to see. Thus melancholy buries hope, which providence keeps still alive, and bids us with afflictions cope, and all anxiety survive. So this man who, as I say, may have had manic, manic depressive cycles, was locked up for madness, never, it was never properly proved or understood what this madness was. Some people say he was mad. Some people say um, that Newbury wanted to get rid of him. Uh, in fact, the newest biography <coughs> makes Newbury quite the villain. But I don't quite get it, because I don't think getting rid of him would have been all that useful for anything, to be honest. But here he is, and he, he dies um, poor and, and, and kind of alone. But his spirit is never broken. Um, he's a gregarious, fun person before all this happened. Uh, who loves sticking on a frock and pretending to be an old lady. Love him. Then in the madhouse, he, he pulls into himself, and he struggles. He has a hard time. But he uses his belief, and he uses nature, and he uses his writing to get through it. And then at the other end, he connects with people again, and he he holds on hope right to the end. And I think that's great. So I like him for lots of reasons. I like his early silly poems. I, I, they're, they're good examples of their kind. I read quite a lot of that kind of Grub Street ephemera. Uh, and he's a good version of it. And he's often quite funny. Um, I love the stuff he wrote in the mental uh, hospital. Not really hospital. <laughs> Lock up. <laughs> I love Jubilate Agno. I love Song to David. Um, they have a passion and a power and a strangeness and then I love the stuff after because it's sweet and melancholy and, and hopeful so I love all his writing but also I'm very fond of Christmas Mark because of what his life sort of says to me um, there were three mid 18th century people that really called to me I suppose there's Samuel Johnson there's Goldsmith and there's Christopher Smart so Samuel Johnson, the guy who was kicked out of university for not having enough money, was a hat writer for 10 years, piled that into a good reputation, and then, using that reputation, changed at least part of the world with what he wrote. That's, that's what I would like to have been, or to be. You know, that's, that's an ideal. Um, Goldsmith... Uh, mooching about with no real clear um, idea in life, ends up falling into writing, ends up being pretty good at it, writes some stuff that's still remembered today, but during his lifetime is thought of as a bit of an idiot. That's probably who I think I am. <laughs> and then Christopher Smart, someone who had this gift, who uh, could have lived a cushy life at university writing academic poetry and, and, and winning the Seatonian Prize every year, but decided to leap into the hack world of, uh, of newspaper and you know, the, the rough and tumble of London and ultimately gets defeated by it, locked up in a madhouse, but never quite gives up hope. We never are deserted quite. And that's, that's me at my, when I'm projecting the worst, I suppose. That's, that's, that's in some ways he's the worst case scenario. But even as the worst case scenario... He clings on and he 
survives ish. Well, he dies. <laughs> he doesn't survive at all. He dies. Everyone dies. But you know, he keeps um, he keeps this pride and he keeps this um, quality of writing and he keeps this sense of hope. And so that's why I love Christopher Smart. And that's why I collect so many books about him because there's a lot that's fuzzy and a lot that hasn't been answered and may never be answered and uh, you read all those different ones and then it helps your take on it so yeah my christopher smart library have a lovely day